Please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for our children. Most of them uh, preferably at home right now, being safe. And so I pray your protection be upon them, that uh, they stay safe, that they still have a mind and heart of adventure and learning and joy. And we pray that for all of us as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Ah, I know that it feels like time is kind of standing still, but it really isn't, and today is Palm Sunday. We will be um, entering Holy Week now. And today on Palm Sunday, we get a, a widescreen image of everything that happens to Jesus during Holy Week. He rides down the Mount of Olives, hearing shouts of Hosanna. He enters the city every day and spends nights with his friends in Bethany. He prays in the garden and is betrayed. He is brought before the high priest. He is beaten, ridiculed, put before a governor, had a mock trial, and then is crucified. The church and the biblical text invite us to both see the entire picture and also break it down into pieces that we can enter into. During this week to come, we will follow Jesus' steps on the way to the cross. And we will do that from different points of view, Monday through Wednesday at 7. We will enter into Jesus' time with his disciples at the Last Supper. We will attempt to pray with him through the night. On Friday, we will enter the darkness of death and then examine a ray of hope on Saturday. Easter will come. In today's Passion reading, I was taken with the use of a word that was spoken twice. And I hope to have you and invite you to, when you read scripture, to let your imagination be free. Think about the words, the phrases, the people, the settings, and let your mind take you to places. It just may be the Holy Spirit, and I guarantee you it will be a whole lot more fun. Uh, so I was taken with a particular word spoken twice. It was first spoken by the wife of Pilate, the governor, and then later by Pilate himself. And the word is innocent. Pilate's wife had a lousy night's sleep. She was haunted by a dream. And this is all that we really know about her. She sends a message to her husband. Have nothing to do with that innocent man. For today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Here is a woman speaking from a distance. She is barely in the image that is Holy Week, yet she knows more than those who are close up and involved in the central parts of the drama. And like it is with too many spouses, her message is ignored. She is wise, but the choices made go another direction. Pilate is the second utterer of that word. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. His wife's distress was focused on a man she had no personal contact with. She warned her husband about that man being innocent. Pilate believed he had to make a different decision about Jesus. Pilate was concerned with his own innocence. It's not on me. She said he is innocent. Pilate said, I am innocent. Too many of our life's dramas hover around that word innocent. We try hard to be the innocent one. Those who are innocent have done nothing wrong. This is probably why the word innocent is used often to describe babies or infants. It is what people plea when they are charged with a crime. I'm innocent, Your Honor. Jesus did nothing wrong. He was innocent of the charges against him, not guilty. Jesus went through all that he did, all this huge picture of Holy Week. Jesus went through all that he did for the guilty. He died on the cross for those 
who were and are culpable. I like to think that I'm more like Pilate's wife. And yet I can't escape the times I am more like Pilate. It is so easy to turn away from the innocent. It is too easy to turn away from those in need and tell myself that it's not my problem. I am innocent. Because I'm innocent, I'm not involved or responsible. Jesus could have looked at the world and decided that he was innocent and washed his hands of us. Unlike with Pilate, it would have been true. We are all glad that Jesus didn't do that. Jesus gave himself for the guilty, for all of us. And now we follow him. Now we do what he did. Is there someone that Jesus doesn't want you to wash your hands of? Are there ways he wants you, us, to love those we think don't deserve it, those who are guilty? Jesus loves me. He didn't wash his hands. Jesus loves you. He didn't wash his hands. He is the innocent one. Once again, he invites us to follow him and love like he does. And his spirit working in us and helping us will help us to follow him. For truly, this man is God's son. Amen. If you haven't and want to send a question, we invite you to do that. Maybe some have already, and I invite the two of you to comment or ask a question. Go ahead, sir. Uh, well, uh, I was, again, struck with the, all the language about hand washing, given that we are so consciously washing our hands repeatedly these days. Um, and it just struck me as an analogy. if. We think of sin as I think is an appropriate metaphor, sin as a sort of infectious disease that we are all infected with. Mm. Uh, Jesus, God uh, in the flesh, coming as one fully healthy, might well have washed his hands of us and, and, uh, and the infection, but instead, because he is the actual cure, he doesn't wash his hands of us and in so doing reminds us, as, as you so uh, well put it in the sermon, invites us to not wash our hands of any other human being. Wash your hands over and over again to be clear of coronavirus, COVID-19, but not wash your hands of another human being, certainly not of God. You would think that we would have the same conversation after the sermon at 10 o'clock as we did at 8 o'clock, but, but we it don't. feels so different. It it's does. a little bit different. Yeah. And when you were saying that, I was thinking of the tradition in Jesus' time of the people with illnesses and disease who were separated were always put on the outside of town. Quarantined. Quarantined. And yet we hear story after story of Jesus stopping, either going into the town or coming out of the town, healing the people that were there. It, it makes me think that there are people in my life that I wish I could tell them to quarantine themselves from me. You know, I, I would rather you not be a part of my life because I don't like you or you're annoying or, or whatever. Um, and yet that, that feels like I would be abandoning them or forcing them to somehow abandon me, which is not the heart of God, I don't believe. Um, I, I'm, I'm not called to wash my hands of someone else. Um, and, and, and as I said at the eight o'clock, certainly if if I'm in an abusive relationship and I need to get out, that that's a different matter and I can create healthy boundaries, hopefully with the help of others. Um, but to completely shut someone out of my life um, is, I, I think, um, moves in an anti-Christ uh, d direction. Um, so, yeah. I do remember something I said after the eight o'clock sermon that if Pilate had been in the place of praying the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, then it would be more difficult to wash his hands because he would not see himself as the innocent one, mm -hmm. but connected yeah. to all the other sinners. One of our sixth graders has asked a question um, saying, if, if you're always supposed to love your enemies is sort of 
you know, not washing your hands of one another. The opposite of that would be loving your enemies. Um, but if someone were to like break into your house and, and God forbid, kill someone in your family, like, are you still supposed to love and forgive that killer? This is coming from a young person. Um, uh, Bishop? Well, Rector? I, 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 I won't ditch it on the bishop. I will say we really don't think a whole lot about what love means. One of my favorite definitions is, is, is doing something to aid another's spiritual growth, actively be involved. And part of loving people is helping them be responsible. And so I, I think that part of our work as the people of God um, is to hold each other accountable mm -hmm. for our behaviors that, that are sinful, that there are consequences to some of the things that we do. I can love someone and still point out that, well, you hurt me, mm -hmm. um, or you hurt someone that I care for. Right. Um, and I can hopefully, with God's help, love them to a new place mm -hmm. of, of, them, of their own working on to forgive themselves, receiving God's forgiveness. In, in light of Not that, an easy thing, no. though. <laughs> But in light of that question, love wouldn't stop me from calling the police. Right. right. I'd be unloving to not. Good question. Yep. Is there another one? Um, a friend of ours watching from the Middle East um, says that uh, uh, other people think that we are very weak and we can't do anything. Um, so to be cautious perhaps, I don't want to put words in our friend's mouth, but uh, to be cautious that we don't think others weak based on our own perspective, because I think Jesus had some things to say about those who are weak and how we are to uh, love them and n not, not ignore them. Right. It, these, these are powerful thoughts and ideas because we follow Jesus who was innocent and yet was killed, gave himself up for us. He, you could say, became weak, but the Apostle Paul said, God's power is made perfect in weakness. Yeah. So it's a long journey, sometimes really hard to learn to trust God in our lives. To still be smart and wise because God is the author of wisdom, but also to be vulnerable for others. I do also want to, I pointed this out at the eight o'clock and it seems uh, important, maybe even necessary to do so. Uh, you can't fill every sermon with a whole bunch of caveats. So this is not something that Father Ralph necessarily needed to say in the sermon. But Matthew's gospel uh, and the, uh, uh, Matthew's account of the passion has uh, that line where the, the people say, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And uh, sadly, tragically, scandalously, uh, there have been times in the church's history when Christians have taken that to mean that Jews as a people, Jewish people, uh, have what has been called the blood libel, that they are all guilty. Uh, and that is a gross misunderstanding of what the gospel is about. Uh, the people in the gospels always refer to all people and all of us who again and again, one way or another, cry, crucify him uh, as we uh, wash our hands of God or wash our hands of other people. And given that there has been a disturbing rise in recent years of uh, a renewed anti-Semitism, it's important for us to remember that uh, the gospel uh, is not uh, anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic uh, and there's no place for, uh, in Christianity for such attitudes towards any people, but most especially our uh, uh, Jewish brothers and sisters uh, with whom we share so much. When we, on normal Palm Sundays, when we read the Passion Gospel responsively, whose voice yells, crucify him? Us. Everybody. Because that's who the us refers to. Yep. Amen. Continue with